Sinister. Dark shadows on the sea. From U-boat to ballistic missile carrier, diesel to nuclear. This is the story of their transformation into the most lethal warships in history. They are the submarines of the Atlantic. In May 2001, the western coast of Scotland bore witness to an extraordinary event, the 100th anniversary of Her Majesty's submarine service. A dozen submarines from around the world cruised into picturesque Gairloch, home to the Royal Navy's Clyde's naval base. Their presence was a show of respect, a gesture of camaraderie for all submariners. I think it's actually quite remarkable to get together submarines from so many nations and so many places and so many different types of submarine in one location. To bring old enemies like the Russians and the Poles together with the Americans and NATO allies like the Portuguese into one place I think is significant because it does show how important the submarine has been over the last 100 years. The Polish submarine Eagle has cruised far from its usual area of operations in the Baltic to be part of the centennial celebrations. It has traveled further west than any other Polish submarine. There is definitely a feeling of solidarity among seamen, Polish as well as other nationalities. We all face the same difficulties and risks. Our nationality is less of a defining factor here than our sense of community among submariners. We all feel the same way about this. I suppose it really shows that, like all these things, that there's a lot more camaraderie between submariners than national, national flags which would uh, have you believe. The Atlantic Ocean, including the Mediterranean Sea, covers almost 20% of the Earth's surface. Since ancient times, it has played a major role in the fate of empires and nations. This great expanse has been host to the evolution of every type of warship in history. But of all that have put to sea in the last hundred years, none has developed quite like the submarine. The menacing vessels gathered here in Scotland are lethal to a degree unimagined when their predecessors first appeared at the end of the 19th century. If you look back 60 years, submarines used to fight on the surface rather than fighting underwater. They used to sort of stealthily approach something underwater and then pop up and use their gun. That doesn't happen today. They have enough endurance to, to be able to operate very successfully underwater. The first truly capable combat submarines were direct descendants of the Holland a design acquired from the United States and built in Britain at the turn of the century. It was presented to a Royal Navy where steam was still regarded with some suspicion. When Holland appeared, for the first time ever, officers and men did the same thing in the same bucket. The social revolution that the submarine brought with it was astonishing. For the first time ever, officers got oil under their fingernails. By 1914, the Royal Navy's E-Class submarine, diesel electric powered with a crew of 31, set the standard for many years to come. But in the Atlantic, it was the Germans who demonstrated the submarine's potential as a strategic rather than a tactical weapon. In the First World War, the Cunard liner Lusitania was sunk off the southern coast of Ireland by one torpedo with the loss of almost 1,200 lives. The Germans sank millions of tons of Allied shipping and nearly brought Britain to her knees. Only the introduction of the convoy system stemmed the hemorrhage. If you have a 40-ship convoy, that doesn't make a convoy 40 times more detectable. It's probably less than 
one and a half times detectable. Okay, you get a bigger plume of smoke. But if you haven't got a submarine in the right place at the right time, what it means is that you get those 40 ships through. And even if you've got a U-boat in the way, you'll get one shot. In 1918, Germany accepted the armistice, ending the First World War. Many U-boats survived, but they had failed to sink the cargo ships quicker than America could build them. But the victors did not appreciate the submarine's potential. Despite its military insignificance in the First World War, the battleship, not the submarine, continued to dominate Anglo-American naval strategy. The passage of a quarter of a century would witness a repeat of the same near-fatal error the Allies made in 1914. They would again underestimate the submarine. On September the 3rd, 1939, the first day of the Second World War, the German submarine U-30 sank the British passenger liner SS Athenia off the coast of Scotland, killing 118 people. The U-boats were back. Approximately 900 submarines sustained Germany's Atlantic offensive in the war. The vast majority of these were the Type 7, 210 feet long with a crew of 44 and a surface cruising speed of 17 knots. The Type 7 went through several modifications, but the basic design remained the same. It was also extremely manoeuvrable. This made it very good for the kind of convoy battles which the Germans were fighting in the Atlantic, particularly in the early part of the war. They could use their manoeuvrability to weave in and out of the shipping lanes, firing at will, before emerging at the stern of the convoy. They did, as well, have this tremendously happy time off the east coast of America, where millions of tons, I think in the order of five million tons, were sunk off the east coast by a handful of U-boats. By mid-1943, the Allies had developed effective countermeasures against the U-boats. The German response was to develop a faster and deeper diving submarine, one that could operate underwater for extended periods. It was unlike anything the Allies had ever seen. The Type 21 U-boat featured a new, flatter hull form that achieved higher speeds underwater than on the surface. Dr. Helmut Walter, a German engineer, had developed a radical air-independent propulsion system for the Type 21, using hydrogen peroxide for both surface and submerged cruising. In its weakest form, it keeps my hair uh, dyed blonde at about 0.3%. But if you multiply that to 80%, it fizzes. And then if you chuck kerosene in, I mean, you've got this um, vicious fuel that will burn, produce exhaust and steam, and will produce a 30-knot submarine. But this advanced power plant proved too temperamental for operational use. In its place, conventional diesel engines were used. An air-breathing tube called a snorkel allowed the Type 21 to cruise almost indefinitely 20 to 30 feet underwater using diesel power, while simultaneously charging its high-capacity batteries. Even without the Walter engine, the Type 21 was a potent new weapon. The Type 21 could approach, say, a convoy snorkeling, which meant that it was undetectable by radar, for example, that was used during World War II, could approach at reasonable speeds um, attack and leave at reasonable speeds, never having to surface. And traveling at speeds that were probably too great for early generation sonars to track. Germany built 131 Type 21s. Fortunately for the Allies, they arrived too late to have a serious impact on the war. But this product of advanced German engineering would have a significant influence on post-war submarine development on both sides of the Atlantic. At the end of the Second World War, the United States Navy deployed over 200 fleet submarines. These long-range boats had accomplished in the Pacific against Japanese merchant shipping what the Germans had failed to do in the Atlantic against the British. But looming large over the success of the American fleet boat 
was the German Type 21. The victorious allies, including the Soviet Union, embarked on a race to glean the benefits of German submarine research. When I came to work at the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard in 1951, we had three German U-boats that were at the shipyard. Two of them were the latest German boats, the Type 21s. They were very far advanced. At the time, they were probably the most advanced submarines in the world, much further than anything we had. I can remember reviewing German plans, Type 21 plans, and picking a, an idea off myself that I incorporated. They had beautiful plans. The West was galvanized by the rapid growth of the Russian submarine fleet following the breakdown of the wartime alliance. Anti-submarine warfare, or ASW, became an important post-war mission for US and British submarines operating in the Atlantic. The Type 21 and the anticipation, which is more significant, of Russian submarines based on that technology posed a, a substantial challenge to the ASW techniques that were developed during World War II. The US initiated a program called Guppy, short for Greater Underwater Propulsive Power, to modernize the newest of its war vintage hulls using captured Type 21 technology. Battery capacity was doubled, guns were removed, hulls and conning towers were streamlined. Concurrent with various guppy modernization programs, the US Navy developed its own version of the German Type 21. The Tang class was the first post-war submarine designed in the United States. The Tangs breathed through snorkels and were optimized for underwater speed. There was a kind of struggle or search by the submarine force for a new or new missions against an adversary, a very different adversary from the one they had faced in World War II. This U.S. Navy submarine force in the late 1940s begins a series of experiments with both new missions for submarines and new technologies. The 1950s saw Guppy and Tang class submarines deployed in a variety of roles from dedicated sub-killers to lookouts equipped with long-range radars to warn of approaching threats. But what submariners really wanted was a true submersible, one that could remain hidden beneath the surface indefinitely, one that did not have to surface to charge its batteries. Everybody recognized that the submarine had enormous potential, but it was still a weapon of position. You had to rely to a great extent on your target coming to you. Even the fleet submarines, to a certain extent, lacked legs and endurance and high speed. The US and Britain pursued two approaches to underwater propulsion systems that were not dependent on outside oxygen, closed cycle or air independent propulsion and nuclear power. The British revisited Helmut Walter's wartime work with closed cycle engines, but with only limited success. One of the basic problems at that time was that hydrogen peroxide and fuel oxidizer combinations like that are explosive, they're rocket fuel. So this is a dangerous thing to have aboard a submarine. We looked at HTP, high test peroxide, and we built two experimental submarines to follow up using that stuff, called Excalibur and Explorer, colloquially known as the Exploder class. Nuclear power proved more promising. In the United States, the wartime Manhattan Project that developed the atomic bomb had demonstrated that a controlled nuclear reaction could generate the heat required to power a conventional steam turbine. But the engineering problems and the political obstacles remained substantial. And to take that technology and, and obviously radically compress it into an engineering space that could fit within a ship or even more challenging within a submarine, the person that's most associated with this effort is Hyman Rickover. 
Since 1947, Hyman Rickover, a brilliant, irascible engineering officer, had been pushing the newly established U.S. Atomic Energy Commission to develop a nuclear reactor that could power a submarine. But there was little enthusiasm within the civilian sector of the government for a small, expensive shipboard reactor. News that Russia had detonated an atomic bomb in 1949 wiped out the bureaucratic resistance to Rickover's ideas. The Westinghouse Corporation began construction of a prototype small nuclear reactor near Arco, Idaho. At Rickover's insistence, the reactor was built into a life-sized submarine hull underwater. It was called STR, Submarine Thermal Reactor, Mark I. In August 1951, the electric boat company of Groton, Connecticut, received the contract to build the world's first nuclear-powered submarine, the Nautilus. Her keel was laid at the EB yard in Groton on June the 14th, 1952, with President Harry S. Truman officiating. STR Mark II, an almost exact duplicate of the Idaho reactor, was built within the Nautilus. While they were building the boat in EB, they had building a reactor out in Idaho, and it was floated in a tank. As they experimented and found things would work, it would be telegraphed or radioed back to EB, and it was being built subsequently. So we were just one or two steps ahead of the reactor in the EB, and that's how they trained the people. To save time and money, the hull form of the diesel-electric tang class would be used on the new submarine. With the wife of President Eisenhower smashing the traditional champagne bottle against her bow, the Nautilus was launched on January the 21st, 1954. It took another year to install and test her inner workings, including the new reactor. Just after 11 o'clock on January the 17th, 1955, Nautilus left port. For the first time in history, she broadcast the signal, underway on nuclear power. In May 1955, she made her shakedown cruise from New London, Connecticut, to San Juan, Puerto Rico. 1,381 miles in 90 hours, entirely submerged. Nautilus shattered one record after another for submerged high-speed endurance. But the increased tempo of operations aboard a nuclear submarine required adjustments to normal crew responsibilities. On a Nautilus, there was four chief petty officers who were qualified uh, reactor operators. We also were qualified watch supervisors. We could spell the four officers who were qualified to operate the reactor. So that gave us eight people to stand watches, four on four uh, or six, whatever you wished. In April of 1957, Nautilus had her uranium fuel core replaced. After more than two years of operation with the fleet, she had steamed more than 62,000 miles, half of it submerged. A conventional submarine with the same horsepower would have burned over two million gallons of diesel oil, enough to fill 217 rail tanker cars. But Nautilus soon achieved an even more impressive milestone. In the summer of 1957, she began probing the ice pack of the polar Arctic. This was followed the next year by concerted attempts to cross the North Pole, submerged. Following two aborted attempts, Nautilus pulled out of Pearl Harbor on July the 23rd, 1958. We started heading for Panama, and then after we submerged, we turned around and started heading up. And this time it worked. We got all the way around up to Point Barrow, found a deep trench, submerged, and away we went. Project Sunshine. The mission to penetrate the Arctic ice cap was underway. On August the 3rd, 1958, Nautilus passed under the North Pole, the first ship in history to do so. The Nautilus then steamed south, 
entering open ocean between Greenland and Iceland, continued on to Portsmouth, England, and finally New York City for a triumphant welcome home. Nautilus had proved that nuclear propulsion worked and opened a new area for naval operations under the pole. But for all her endurance and speed of 23 knots submerged, Nautilus could never fulfill the full potential of nuclear propulsion. Unlike all prior submarines which visited underwater, a nuclear submarine was going to live underwater. This posed tremendous challenges, especially for a very high-powered submarine, in terms of how to control a submarine that was really maneuvering in three dimensions underwater the way an airplane maneuvers in three dimensions above the surface of the Earth. Even before Nautilus began her early trials with nuclear propulsion, the US Navy had designed another submarine, the Albacore, as part of its broad-based research into submarine technology. Albacore was a pure research vessel that, while conventionally powered, utilized the shape of an airship or dirigible. Her shorter, fatter hull, tested in a wind tunnel, had made for underwater speed and maneuverability, achieving a previously unheard of 33 knots submerged. The Albacore pioneered many things for the U.S. Navy submarine force, one of the most important of which was one-man control. One man sitting where I am would, in effect, fly the Albacore just like a pilot would fly an aircraft. The control column turning left would turn the ship left, turning right would turn the boat right, push her forward, the diving planes would send her deeper. You pull the column back, and the planes would send her back toward the surface. In front of you, you had the various instruments and things that would tell you what your course was, how deep you were, how fast you were going, and everything you needed to uh, control the ship. Albacore could make tight, banked turns, even snap rolls, an unnerving and potentially fatal phenomenon for which he underwent extensive modifications. In the after end of the sail, there was a dorsal rudder, which is controlled by these two buttons. When you did a real hard turn, it would induce a snap roll into the ship, like it would heel over toward the center of the turn. The dorsal rudder would counteract the snap roll and keep it on an even keel vertically. For 20 years, Albacore performed underwater high-speed research, providing the hydrodynamic foundation for all modern submarines. She is now preserved as a museum in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. The wealth of technical information obtained from the Nautilus and Albacore programs revolutionized U.S. submarine design. The first vessel to combine Albacore's hydrodynamic shape with the nuclear propulsion of Nautilus was the Skipjack, commissioned in April 1959. Skipjack class boats were fast but noisy. Skipjack is a teardrop hull, nuclear light water reactor, first operational 30 knot submarine, very loud, uh, not a great listening platform. For a submarine, stealth, in addition to speed, is essential to maneuvering in for the kill. Two years after the skipjack, the essential qualities of high performance and silence were successfully fused in the Thresher, commissioned in August 1961. If you look at Thresher, she's a lot bigger than skipjack, and one of the reasons is because that's what you have to do to quiet a fast nuclear submarine. It takes volume, and so Thresher was slower than skipjack. But on the other hand, Thresher was still a 30-knot submarine, and Thresher was very quiet. The $45 million Thresher was bred for speed and maneuverability. Among her many innovations was the use of so-called high-yield steel, 
capable of sustaining 80,000 pounds per square inch, allowing Thresher to dive twice as deep as older submarines. Her propulsion plant was mounted on rubber pads, so the noise from pumps and turbines never radiated to the hull, where it would escape into the sea. In the words of one submariner, comparing the noise made by the threshers against the skipjacks is like comparing a Cadillac to a Model A Ford. I had been to sea on sea trials on board her several times. She was a pride and joy of the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. She was a, a wonderful ship. Everybody involved with her, including the crew, uh, thought she was the greatest thing the Navy had, and she was at that time. But Thresher's celebrity would soon strike an ominous note. On the morning of April the 10th, 1963, while conducting a post-overhaul test dive off New England, Thresher approached her assigned depth of more than 1,000 feet. Suddenly, a pipe joint failed, producing catastrophic flooding. Thresher plunged out of control into the inky blackness of the Atlantic. When her crush depth was exceeded, the submarine imploded. Debris, along with the bodies of 129 men, rained down on the ocean floor. One month after the Thresher disappeared, the deep-diving bathoscope Trieste photographed wreckage of the ill-fated submarine lying 8,400 feet beneath the surface. With the loss of the Thresher, the Navy went back to the drawing board and very carefully analyzed everything involved with operating submarines at deep depths and came up with numerous safety improvements which were known as the Subsafe program. One of the most dramatic results of the Subsafe program was the development of the emergency blow surfacing procedure. Helm, all head standard. Chief of the watch, emergency blow, all main The concept was first tested on the Albacore. It's like a, a panic switch that you can throw and it'll blow all your ballast tanks. It'll dump all of your high-pressure air into your ballast tanks and give you the maximum buoyancy you can get to drive you back to the surface. Dive emergency surface to ship. Surface to ship. Watch this demonstration of sheer propulsive energy is practiced today by every U.S. submarine. It is symbolic of unrelenting progress, of lessons learned, and a salute to 129 men who never returned in 1963. Since its inception, the development of the submersible fighting ship has been a contest of form and function, of hydrodynamic purity versus operational requirements. Of the many contemplated uses for submarines, none has been more challenging than as a platform for guided missiles. During the Second World War, a German proposal to launch V-2 rockets from canisters towed behind U-boats at sea was never implemented. But after the war, the US and the Soviet Union did pursue the concept of sea-borne ballistic missiles. In 1947, a captured V-2 was test-fired aboard the aircraft carrier Midway as part of a feasibility study. The liquid-fueled V-2 lurched wildly into the sky and nearly took off the carrier's superstructure. Hydrogen peroxide fuel oxidizer combinations are dangerous in a, in a submarine because they're like rocket fuel. Well, now we're really talking about rocket fuel uh, if you're going to launch a, a missile from the submarine, and it's the same problem. The U.S. Navy concentrated instead on shorter range and considerably less dangerous jet-powered V-1 doodlebugs. In February 1947, the USS Cusk launched the first guided missile from a submarine. In the mid-1950s, the more advanced Regulus cruise missile was specifically designed for submarine use. Carried in a watertight hangar aft of the conning tower, the Regulus was essentially an unmanned jet aircraft that could fly 500 miles at 600 miles an hour. Regulus was a fairly large cruise missile, carried a fairly large nuclear weapon. And the submarine, in order to launch the missiles, of course, had to surface, but then also had to turn on a radar that was going to track the missile and provide guidance commands to it. 
American nuclear superiority was again challenged when, in 1952, the Soviets detonated a thermonuclear, or hydrogen bomb, less than a year after the United States. The implications were far-reaching. At the urging of the Eisenhower administration, the US Navy and Army began joint development of a new ballistic missile to carry a heavy thermonuclear warhead. The missile would be of intermediate range, approximately 1,500 miles. And despite the Navy's aversion to potentially explosive propellants, the missile was to be liquid-fueled. The project gained momentum with the advancement of Admiral Arleigh Burke to Chief of Naval Operations in mid-1955. Burke strongly supported the sea-based missile concept. You have to remember at that time that, in general, nuclear weapons had become kind of the centerpiece of the U.S. military. The U.S. Air Force, which at that time was essentially nothing but a nuclear delivery service, had 50 percent of the defense budget. Burke appointed Rear Admiral William Rayburn to head the Navy's Special Projects Office. The schedule to get the missile to sea was 10 years. Target date, 1965. The big challenge initially, of course, was that missiles were still liquid fuel. And it's a measure of Burke's determination to go forward with this project that the Navy decided to begin its own ballistic missile program. Admiral Burke's decision to break away from the Army program was influenced by several technical breakthroughs, including advances in solid fuel rocket engines and the scaling down of thermonuclear warheads. Polaris the Navy's solid fuel fleet ballistic missile program was formally approved on New Year's Day in 1957. Ten months later, the Soviets again stunned the West by launching their Sputnik satellite into Earth orbit. In response, U.S. missile programs, including Polaris, were accelerated. The problem was that a submarine for the new missile had not yet been designed. In desperation, the Navy looked to modify boats already under construction. They discovered that you could fit a 1,500-mile solid fuel missile of the type they were trying to design inside the hull of the existing skipjack attack submarines that we were building. And so George Washington, which was the first SSBN, is basically a skipjack with a big plug in the hull where 16 Polaris missiles were, were put. On June the 9th, 1959, what was originally intended to be the attack submarine Scorpion was launched instead as the George Washington, the first U.S. ballistic missile submarine. A year later, in July 1960, she fired her first Polaris missile from underwater. Four months after that, the George Washington put to sea. The first ever American Strategic Deterrent Patrol had started five years earlier than originally planned. The ship, Submersible, Ballistic Missile, Nuclear, or SSBM, had become a reality. Several generations of SSBNs have patrolled Atlantic waters since 1960. Today, it is 10 submarines of the Ohio class. At over 560 feet long and 42 feet wide, they are the largest submarines ever built in the United States. Each Ohio class carries 24 Trident D-5 missiles, each missile in turn carrying up to eight independently targeted nuclear warheads with a range of 4,600 miles. With the ability to stay submerged for months at a time, Ohio's are virtually invulnerable while on patrol. They constitute the most effective nuclear deterrent ever developed. Their crews have summed up their SSBN mission with only the slightest hint of sarcasm. Hide with pride. Berlin, November 1989. The fall of what had been a long-standing symbol of East-West rivalry 
thrust the US defense establishment, including the submarine community, into a period of transition. The number of Ohio-class SSBNs on deterrent patrol was to be reduced. Roles and missions are still being redefined for a post-Cold War world. Today, more fast attack submarines, or SSNs, prowl the Atlantic than any other type. The United States deploys around 27 Los Angeles-class subs from its eastern seaboard. Los Angeles-class attack submarines are quiet and fast, with speeds exceeding 30 knots. They are packed with electronics for ASW and surveillance, and by the standards of earlier nuclear submarines, they are crowded. We're a very compact, dense platform as far as uh, sensors and weapons are. And uh, unfortunately, uh, when it comes to habitability for the crew, we, we have to take a second there. Our guys sleep down in the torpedo room. We hot bunk, which means we'll have uh, basically three guys sharing two bunks, which uh, means they're sleeping in shifts. In addition to its usual load of torpedoes, the Los Angeles class has been modified to launch Tomahawk land attack missiles, or T-LAMs. The cruise missile has revolutionized the role of the fast attack submarine providing it with an offensive strike capability previously reserved for the aircraft carrier. We've got to carry the battle to the front lines, and we spend a lot more time on the surveillance missions and on the strike missions, that is, the uh, Tomahawk strike stuff. The successor to the Los Angeles class, the Seawolf, is considered the first all-new U.S. attack submarine since the Skipjack class of the late 1950s. With a published submerged speed of 35 knots, Seawolf is faster than the Los Angeles class and has improved electronic systems. She was given the hull number 21, as in 21st century. But almost from its inception, Seawolf has been embroiled in controversy. It is the most expensive submarine ever built, appearing at a time when her primary mission, hunting advanced Russian submarines, has all but disappeared since the collapse of the Soviet Union. In response to Seawolf's escalating costs, the Navy initiated development of a multi-mission attack submarine, substantially less expensive than Seawolf, but still capable of maintaining undersea superiority. The Virginia class, the first of which is scheduled for commissioning in 2004, is advertised as having all the best qualities of the Los Angeles class with additional advanced electronic systems. Virginia's sensory capabilities include so-called wide aperture sonar to seek out a specific kind of threat. As fast attack submarines increasingly operate closer to shore, whether to launch cruise missiles or to support special operations, they enter what the Navy calls brown water. This is the realm of the small, super quiet diesel electric submarine, exemplified by the Russian Kilo class, first introduced in 1982. This advanced version of the Kilo, the Vologda, came all the way from the Kola Peninsula, home to Russia's North Sea Fleet, to take part in the British submarine centennial. Submarines of Project 877, we call her Varshavyanka, do not operate in open ocean. They're intended for close range actions for us, the Barents Sea, the Norwegian Sea. The Kilo is a general purpose submarine with good habitability. Unlike the American Los Angeles class, hot bunking is not required by the 60-man crew. Here the living conditions are incomparable to older boats. Each officer, midshipman and seaman has a cot or a cabin of his own. There he can relax after his watch, or read a book or daydream. 
With an estimated submerged speed of 25 knots, kilos are virtually silent on electric power. ASW against diesel boats has been compared to hunting rabbits. They can be seen and shot running across a field, but are a lot harder to catch dodging in and out of the hedgerows. The remarkable feature of this boat is a very low noise level. It's the lowest among our subs. The guys call this submarine a black hole. The Kilo class and other modern diesel electric submarines provide an effective platform for a variety of sensors and lethal weapons at a fraction of the cost of a nuclear powered SSN. These new Kilo class are for all intents and purposes like nuclear powered attack submarines because they have the same systems on board, their sonars and, uh, and their weapon systems are, are comparable. They just don't have the endurance, the 90 days submerged, for example. But even poorer endurance is becoming less of a factor. The air independent propulsion concept, first introduced in 1940s Germany by Helmut Walter, has finally achieved operational status. The Swedish Gotland class, introduced in 1995, uses a closed cycle system of diesel oil and liquid oxygen to produce heat, driving a generator, which in turn powers electric motors. They can remain submerged for many weeks. During the hundred years that they have put to sea, no warship has so influenced the course of history as the submarine. Its offensive capabilities, endurance, and invisibility have changed naval strategy forever. The submarine has emerged as the capital ship of the modern era, one whose shadow will glide menacingly through the Atlantic long into the future.